Hello and welcome to Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today we're going to go into the world of eye care and optometry. And helping us go into that world is Dr. David Kosalik from Kosalik Eye Center. Welcome, Dr. Kosalik. Thank you, David. Uh, pleasure to be here. Great to have you on the show. Um, in terms of your background in education, could you give us a summary of you know, what you all went through to, to your current you know, status? I'm a Sheboygan native, and I, I went to North High School. I spent my first year here in this facility at UW-Sheboygan, and then eventually graduated from Lakeland College mm -hmm. a few years ago. I was a biology major and a chemistry minor and wasn't sure what to do with that, and I would say maybe my dad was more worried what I would do with that than anything. Mm -hmm. But then I did attend optometry school. I got my doctorate from the Illinois College of Optometry. So quite a few years ago, 1980, the time flies. Um, you know, I am a board certified optometrist. I am very pleased with that program. It maintains some lifelong learning to keep that kind of certification. So I've been in Howard's Grove since 1980. My wife and I, we have two girls. Both my girls are out of school finally, off the payroll, so it's a good feeling. And, my wife Mary and I continue to live in Howard's. So and that's where you have your current practice, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. I've been in that practice for since 1980. Initially, I worked elsewhere for a couple years just uh, as the practice grew, but now I, I we've been there in our present location since 2012. Yep. Excellent. The world of optometry. I know I've heard different terms or different studies of it, like ophthalmology, optometry. You know, the different disciplines, so to speak. Could you go in and? kind of explain differences between them? I think it is confusing, and I think because they're all O's, and you know, sometimes mm -hmm. people ask me if I'm, I'm an obstetrician, and you know, and I'm not. I don't want anything to do with babies, but you know, the three O's in eye care, optician would be the person that works on your glasses, you know, that cuts lenses, grinds lenses. You know, it's a skill, and they go to school for two years, and they have ongoing certification for that program. You know, there's more to optics than just uh, uh, popping a pair of glasses on somebody. I, I think in my practice, we are really blessed with some very qualified, very knowledgeable people that do very well with that. You know, an optician really gets a two-year technical school degree. An optometrist like myself goes, receives their undergraduate college degree and then pursues a doctorate degree another four years. You know, for me, it was in Chicago. Um, you know, it is, optometrists are trained in primary eye care. So we're not surgeons. If you, uh, like if a patient of mine needs surgery, I'm gonna work with a surgeon on mm -hmm. that person and their problems that way, but we do not do surgery. We do primary eye care, be it treat red eyes, glaucoma, we prescribe glasses, contact lenses, that sort of thing. An ophthalmologist is the next step up the ladder, let's say, and that would be someone that did their four years of undergraduate college, bachelor's degree, attends medical school for another four years, and then chooses a, chooses a residency in ophthalmology, which is a three year after their MD degree, specializing in eye diseases, eye surgeries. That's really the person, if, if you need cataract surgery, that's very mm -hmm. likely the person that you're gonna see. You know, that some ophthalmologists go another step and, and obtain a fellowship, and that would be specializing in a specific area. Some cataract surgeons have fellowships in that area, or cornea, or glaucoma, or retina. So you really kind of keep going up the mm -hmm. ladder. I mean, we can get as specialized as we need to, you know, and we're really blessed, I think, in our area that we have such uh, quality referral people uh, and the glaucoma and the cataract side of things. It's rare that I need to send somebody to Milwaukee or Green Bay because those specialists are right here amongst us. That's nice to know. In your practice, um, what's the size of your practice and the, basically the type of patients that you treat for? I mean, you know, I would say my practice is, we're a busy practice. It's myself and Dr. Beiersdorf. Okay. And, you know, on the average, we see 20 people each a day. and. Um, you know, it varies from probably Dr. Beiersdorf does more children than I do, and maybe I, just as I'm older, my patient uh, mm -hmm. base has evolved, has gotten older with me, so okay. I probably see more of a, a little bit more mature population, but 
I, this morning I was in the office, Dr. Beiersdorf was doing an infant at a year old, and you know, I can say I saw someone at 91 this morning. So it varies a great deal, okay. and some of it is routine, and some of it is problem. Someone has uh, something in their eye this weekend. I was in several times for that, so. Okay. You had mentioned, you know, your patient base stays with you and has, you know, grown older with you because yeah. they stay with you. What should somebody who's looking for an eye doctor be looking for as far as that patient doctor relationship? You know, maybe I think, you know, I want, if I look for another doctor, I want someone that's committed to learning, to lifelong learning. I want to know that the person I'm dealing with is at the peak of their field and maintains that peak. So I think I would list that as number one. And I would say number two would be trust. You know, I just think you need to trust that person you're seeking advice from. And maybe lastly, the ability to communicate. You know, if you have the best doctor and you can't, you know, communicate both ways, you know, it's not a right. one-way street, me telling you it's got to be both ways. I have to learn to listen. So those would be my items, lifelong learning, trust, and the ability to communicate or establish that rapport, I guess. Okay, excellent. Um, as far as eye health, how often should somebody go and get their eyes checked? I would say like a routine, if we looked at maybe some of the American Academy you know, guidelines as far as when should you have your eyes examined, I would say a healthy adult I like to see in two years. So a routine exam, everything is looking good, I tell people come back in two years. That is you know, the routine though. For example, a diabetic needs to be seen annually. There's just issues that develop. Some medications can affect the eyes. Maybe six months is appropriate for that. I think more often than not, we'll see kids sooner because their vision changes. You know, they're growing. Their eyes are changing a lot more than your eyes or my eyes that way. So maybe in a general idea, if you said just routine, healthy adult, how frequently, I would tell you two years. But I think that varies. People have had surgery. People are wearing contact lenses. We like to see contact lenses more frequently. So it varies a little bit that way. Okay. You had mentioned earlier some of the conditions that people can develop, like you know cataracts and such. What are some of the diseases that people face nowadays with their eyes or conditions? You know, if I, I think of like the three main causes of blindness here in the United States, and we'd list them, diabetes would be number one. As we get older, macular degeneration is, a, is the number one cause of blindness. And glaucoma would be number three. Worldwide, cataracts is the leading cause of blindness, but the reason that is so is because they don't have the ability to correct it. You know, mm -hmm. here if we have a cataract and people start to lose their vision, it's a 10-minute surgery type thing, and, and we're done with that. You know, in some of the you know, third world countries, that ability to correct it just isn't there. You know, diabetes is, you know, a, a, an epidemic, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I would say a day doesn't go by that we don't see diabetics in the office. And I like to tell my diabetics that the tighter they control their blood sugar, that A1C that stays around six or less, I don't see eye problems. But when that gets away on them, they are going to suffer that way. So there's a lot of, you know, as healthcare evolves and as optometry evolves, I think the communication between family doctor, optometrist, uh, specialist just continues to evolve. You know, I would say, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of my time is set writing letters, you mm -hmm. know, dictating letters to primary care physicians saying so-and-so was in and his eyes look great or, or they don't look so good. Right. You know, macular degeneration, you know, if you think of our elderly people, nothing would affect retirement like losing your vision, losing your driver's license, mm -hmm. losing the ability to read a paper, you know, right. the, just a terrible, terrible disease. And we're getting to the point in the 30 some years that I practice, we finally have some things that they maybe don't sound the best, but injections into the back of the eye that can not only prevent the progression or slow the progression, actually reverse it and give people their vision back. So, you know, it's been a really exciting mm -hmm. area that way. Glaucoma, if there's a danger on glaucoma, as we talk about the third one, it's that there really aren't symptoms. You know, I can, I can tell you if you're diabetic and you're starting to have macular edema, you're going to have some visual if issues. You're going to complain a little bit. 
diabetics lose their peripheral vision, and by the, or I'm sorry, glaucoma people lose their peripheral vision, and by the time they're aware of it, it's a little too late. You know, that ongoing, such an easy thing to catch if we get it early that way. But those would be the three that I see day to day that would be concerning for me. Okay. Just a little bit more definition for our viewers. Could you go into how does diabetes affect the eye, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and cataracts other than the car that Catwoman drives? Okay. <laughs> I yeah, had to bring yeah, that in yeah. there. It's a little <laughs> funny. Come on. <laughs> we, um, well, diabetes, you know, I, in a nutshell maybe, and maybe there's nothing simple, but the blood vessels inside your eye like to hemorrhage or bleed mm -hmm. in diabetes, and that causes some swelling in the back of the eye, and that causes some loss of vision. So, you know, I think as eye doctors we want, it helps the primary care person know that their present treatment is good. If I can write back and say sure. this looks perfect, their insulin is working well, or doesn't look so perfect. Or if there are problems in the retina, then to be able to refer to that retinal specialist, that fellowship trained person, that they can do some aggressive treatment with that to prevent them losing vision. You know, macular degeneration is a, a, one of those things that we're not, we don't know the cause, you know, and that's kind of scary. You'd think, well, if it's a cardiovascular problem, we could say, well, then diabetics are gonna have more macular degeneration than otherwise, you know, than the normal population, and that's not true. So we used to tell people there were three risk factors in macular degeneration, and one of them was getting older. The older we get, the more problematic that becomes. You know, secondly, it's a, a, an ethnic problem. White people, Caucasians, are the ones that suffer with macular degeneration, more so than other groups, Latinos, you know, black people that way. And lastly, smokers have a much higher incidence of macular degeneration than non-smokers. And they try to cut out all the other variables, but I think bottom line, if I could tell somebody that's concerned about having a family history of macular degeneration, I'd say don't smoke. You know, that would be the big one. That macula starts to break down. The macula is the central part of your vision. So it's the most sensitive. So as you look at me right now, it's the part that has the most cones. So if you have macular degeneration, you see a big spot where I am, and you can see the fireplace off to your mm -hmm. left and my right, but you can't see straight ahead. So they lose that straight ahead vision. You know, maybe if we can be reassuring to those people and say, well, you won't go blind entirely, that you will see nothing. But realistically, you cannot drive a car, you cannot write a check, you cannot read a menu at a restaurant. Right. You know, and they're doing some nice things if we get that early diagnosis. People that have had macular degeneration for some time, that injection is not a cure-all. If, you know, I don't want this to, someone to see that and say, well, I've had macular disease and I can't see, and now I'm gonna go in and see a retinal person and they're gonna fix it because that isn't the case. Right. We need to get it early that way, so. So that's a struggling one. You know, in glaucoma, you know, maybe a, for some reason the optic nerve dies off. And we think it has to do with pressure. So a lot of times, you'll, you know, years ago we had the puff of air test or mm -hmm. there's that blue light that we measure the pressure. The inside of your eye is a fluid and that fluid is always being replaced. You get new fluid going into the eye and old fluid drains away. And what often happens is the drainage doesn't work as well. So you get this new fluid going in and it doesn't drain like it should, so that pressure starts to build up. And as the pressure builds up, it suffocates the nerve. And there are other factors, but maybe in a nutshell, that would be the issue. And so what we try to do then is control that pressure. And we have drops that improve the outflow, you know, that make the mm -hmm. drainage work better. And we have other drops that decrease the production of new fluid or maybe a laser procedure to open up some more ducts, or maybe traditional surgery, that glaucoma fellow again, that mm -hmm. can give us the help that maybe we couldn't do with drops. What scares me or many about glaucoma is there aren't really symptoms. You know, it's kind of like, you know, maybe even when I see a patient and they have a problem, it's almost I have to convince them they have a problem. If you have a cataract and you come in and you say, well, I'm not seeing well, and I say, well, it's because you've developed a cataract, at least you know you have a problem. If I say you have glaucoma and you say, well, geez, I'm just here because I scratched my glasses. You know, it, right. it's a little bit more of a, a, a understanding. Maybe again, going back to that communication, you sure. know, I have to make sure you understand what we're talking about and why we need to do something. And usually that something is very simple. A eye drop once a day and we just prevent you from ever losing vision that way. Okay. 
No last question, or at least I hope I'm still yep. moving in the we're, right we're direction. Right on target. Yep. Yep. Cataract wise, you know, cataracts form right behind the iris. The human lens, like when you and I were children, that lens was crystal clear perfect, you know, and it would be like looking right through a sheet of crystal clear glass. But as time goes on, that glass hazes a little bit. It gets foggy. It mm -hmm. turns a little yellow that way. And if it gets bad enough, we start to lose vision on it that way. So that lens starts to break down. You know, a lot of thought about ultraviolet light being a big factor that way. Some medications can be a factor, but probably if you said, if you said to me, what's the leading cause of cataracts? I would say birthdays, you know, we're getting older. Right. And the second leading cause I would say would be ultraviolet light. So cataract wise, you'd have blurred vision. You know you have an issue that way. You know, sometimes we can correct it with glasses. I tell people cataracts aren't an emergency situation. You know, it's not like, well, let's take it out now while it's little. You know, we take it out when it affects the way you live. Sure. And you know, if you have a little cataract and you say, well, it's there, maybe your vision isn't quite 20 20, but it doesn't really bother you. We're just going to watch that. And I think that's what I would do for my own eye. On the other hand, if you said, I'm a truck driver and I'm having more trouble with glare at night because of that little cataract, I don't know of a surgeon that would say no to you that way. Right. We take it and we go. Okay. Thank you for clarifying those. I've always wondered about you yeah. know the differences and how they're yeah. affected because I know when I go and do the test, you say, oh, this looks good, that looks good, but now it kind of rounds the circle yeah. as far as you know what that really means. So Perfect. thank you for that. Um, as far as symptoms, you know, what types of symptoms could someone be experiencing if you know their eyes are starting to, you know, go in the wrong direction, yeah. so to speak? You know, I think for most of us, the first kind of red flag out there would be blurred vision. You know, I think if you and I were sitting here and I'm having some trouble doing far away or up closer, so, you know, that's a good time to come in. So I think probably most people that I see have as their chief complaint or the reason they're there is that they have some, some reason for blur, something that changed that way. You know, things that worry me probably, like, a new onset of floaters. You know, probably <laughs> most of us... <coughs> Excuse me. Most of us occasionally see floaters, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I would say an occasional floater that's been there for years doesn't bother me a great deal. But when people call the office and say, I have a new, I'm seeing spots out of one eye, and maybe sometimes they're seeing lightning bolts or so, that's an emergency. If you ever want to get into an eye doctor in a hurry, you tell them you're seeing floaters or flashes, and if they don't see you that day, you don't want to go there anyway, okay? Gotcha. So floaters that change are a scary thing. Blurred vision always makes us think. Uh, double vision is, you know, uh, double vision is, um, if you said to me, well, what are the leading causes of double vision? And I, I would tell you diabetes and thyroid disease. Those are the two. If someone comes in and says, I'm watching TV and I see two TVs at night, those are the ones that come to the top of my list. I mean, it could be other things. You could have a stroke. There could be a tumor, things like that. But number one and number two are going to be diabetes and thyroid disease that way. Okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In <coughs> oh. Cold, sorry. I'm glad it's you, not me. Yep, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Um, in today's world, what are some of the corrective measures that are available to patients, you know, to correct their eyesight? I mean, there's glasses, there's contacts, there's LASIK, you know. Yeah. I guess what's all out there and when do you recommend each? And it's funny, glasses have been the standby for a long time. And I would say they continue to be the standby for most people. You know, and the, even in glasses, some of the things they've done with uh, no-line bifocals and anti-reflective lenses and lenses that illuminate ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. you know, they've really done some nice things glasses-wise. That has evolved, uh, you know, just amazingly, even in the 30 years that I've practiced that way. Contact lenses, you know, it used to be, well, you can't wear contact lenses because you have astigmatism or mm -hmm. you have dry eye. And, and again, contact lenses have evolved so much. Or when I started wearing lenses, I had those little boiling units, you know, we used to boil the saline in a little yep. bubbler and, you know, now it's one day throwaway. You know, it, the technology has evolved. Refractive surgery is for, for the right person, just a, you know, a blessing, you know, mm -hmm. a miracle, essentially. I always remember a patient that said to me, they had a very strong prescription, and, and she said that she was afraid to go to a hotel because if there was a fire she, and she couldn't get her glasses, she'd never get out. You know, I'm nearsighted, and I have a prescription, but I never had that thought. My prescription wasn't that strong, but 
for her, the peace of mind that refractive surgery gives her is, you know, was worth every nickel she spent on it that way. You know, some of the things that we're talking about with uh, macular degeneration, how about cataract surgery like we talked about? You know what? Sure. What used to be, like when I was in school, wearing these big, thick Coke bottle glasses after cataract surgery, you know, now people, the day after their surgery, will say, I haven't seen this good in 50 years, right. you know. Just the technology has been so exciting, you know. It's kind of, you wonder where it's gonna go next, you know, it's just been quite all right. Mm -hmm. I think back to when I first went to an eye doctor, Imig Meyer and Wall in Sheboygan, yep. and you know, they had the lenses, and uh, there were probably like six frames we could pick from, and three of them were brown and three were black, and that was about the extent of it. And, and they were stylish. <laughs> and they were all, all six of them were very yep. stylish. And I think five of those six have come back again. Yep. You know, that uh, retrofit looks very good again. Mm -hmm. um, funny you should mention that, I started out I've had glasses since I've been in first grade, since I was in first grade. And I started out with Dr. Schott, and actually I had eye surgery when I was really young. And then went to Emig Meyer and Wall, so and so, and now I'm with um, your establishment as well. And throughout the years I've had glasses, I've had contacts, and then finally a few years ago I had the LASIK surgery, which I know we didn't agree at first, but to me it turned out really well yeah. as far as how my case went, you know, as far as that goes. Yeah. And to me, it's a blessing with the LASIK, you know, as far as I can see, because I'm always active outside or hunting, and first thing, my glasses would always steam up yeah. or whatever, you know, sitting there and whatever else. So, I mean, to me, it really helped. You know, again, maybe going back to any individual, it does, you know, everything is limited, in tr including mm -hmm. glasses and contact lenses and refractive surgery. There's, you know, I can't say there's the perfect correction, you know, nothing we have is quite as good as, as perfect, let's say, but, you know, to approach any of those, including refractive surgery, and say, well, I'm willing to have surgery and continue to use reading glasses is certainly, uh, you know, for that right person, again, sure. for that female patient of mine, to give her the comfort to go to a hotel room, right. you know, I mean, that's just, uh, you know, uh, I think it's harder to do certain corrections, just be, you know, at one point we only did nearsightedness mm -hmm. in refractive surgery. Right. That was all that was done. And then they started to do farsightedness. And then we started to do nearsighted and astigmatism. And then finally the farsighted and astigmatism issues. And, mm -hmm. you know, at some point, you know, we'd be foolish to say that we won't be able to get rid of the reading glass issue. Yep. You know, at some point to say that option should be there. Yep. And we're just not quite there yet that no, way. I would agree because I had the surgery. When I first had it, everything was crystal clear. I could read the serial number on a dollar bill. Yeah. But as the age kept up, you know, here we yeah, are. Yeah, I've got right. them as well. So right. there they are, right. you know, as far as that goes. And that's the biggest thing I've noticed. Yeah. But even still, if I have to wear cheaters, right. that doesn't bother me. You're still hunting and all the rest yep. of it without it. Yeah, yep, exactly. Maybe realistic expectations. You know, maybe as a primary care person to say that something that we need to make sure people have those you know, not to sell anything, but to make sure people make a good informed choice that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, respect to eye care and eye health. Is there something that people can do to help promote their health? You know, like you go to a general physician, obviously they say you keep your weight down, so the blood pressure's down and diabetes. Does that all apply to your eyes as well, or is there other things that people can do to help promote, you know, their eye health? You know what? I think what I like to tell patients is that what's good for your heart is good for your eyes. So if you think of anything diet-wise that's good for your heart and your cardiovascular system, it's good for your eyes as well. And I wish I had a magic vitamin. You know, mm -hmm. I wish I could say if you take vitamin such and such, that is going to be the best thing for your eyes. But unfortunately, that has not been established that way. You know, they. They've done some really nice studies on, on multivitamins, and you'll see a lot of vitamins in, you know, at Walgreens and the drugstores that way, and all market eye health. And you know, the people that have early macular degeneration, it's been proven that they benefit from a multivitamin and a set regimen, and that was called the ARID study, the age-related eye disease study. And that, so maybe on my part, I keep those vitamins and they buy them at Walgreens. It's not something we sell. They get sure. them anywhere that way. But those people, if you have the start of macular disease, the studies have said a multivitamin will slow or halt the progression of the disease. And that same study took other people and it looked for cataracts and said, well, if we put a patient that has the start of a cataract, will that slow or halt the progression? And the answer was no. 
And they took healthy individuals and they looked that had no sign of macular degeneration and said, well, would this individual or would these people benefit down the road if they took a multivitamin? And the answer was no. Hmm. So at this point, on my patients, I tell them, if you have the start of macular disease, I want you to take these vitamins. And if you don't, there's nothing I'm recommending other than what's good for your heart is good for your eyes. Okay, well, that's good sound advice. Basic common sense. Yeah. One of my favorite vitamin stories, and maybe I'm getting off on a tangent, and, but you know, I still get people that'll come in and talk about bilberry tea. And they drink bilberry tea because it improves their night vision. And, uh, I think that's a very interesting you know concept and I you know there's not a lot of research behind it but during World War II the British pilots were always drinking bilberry tea before they would go up on their night missions over Germany and the British pilots had an outstanding success rate and the British Secret Service essentially sent this propaganda out that why their pilots did so well was because they drank so much bilberry tea. When in reality, the British had developed radar mm -hmm. and they had a very nice system of getting these uh, enemy planes out of the air and it had nothing to do with bilberry tea, but that, that, that rumor or you know, that thought persists to this day that bilberry tea helps mm -hmm. your night vision. So. We owe that to the British Air Force, I guess. Nice. Well, today's medicine is based on, you know, the cures of years ago where all you had was roots and herbs and whatever else. I mean, that's where today's medicine has come from. You know, and we're learning as we go, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't argue with people that, that want to take bilberry tea, you know, I think, or vitamins in general, because I think next year it may say a whole different thing, you know. Sure. It, we're learning, just like mm -hmm. you said. I think it's really interesting that medical schools, many medical schools right now have... In, as part of their curriculum, food, you know, as in food being a drug, you know, and mm -hmm. this is just as much a drug as your lisinopril or your uh, Mivacor or whatever that mm -hmm. way, but what we eat has got a lot more to do with things than, than what we ever realized possible that way. Excellent. If someone wants to learn or research more about, you know, optometry, eye care, what are some good sources to go to? And you said I could give myself a little plug here. Absolutely. So, you know, I think we have a nice website, CaselicEyeCenter.com, and, and maybe the issue on that would be more so the links. Mm -hmm. You know, the American Optometric Association is a good link. The uh, National Eye Institute, a government group, you know, again, a good link on eye diseases that way. There's a website out there called ThinkAboutYourEyes.com, and again, it's, it's a coalition of optometrists, opticians, ophthalmologists that have just kind of pushed, you know, eye education essentially, not biased to one group or the other, but just what's good for the public kind of thing. So those are three really good sites that I would recommend that I think were enjoyable and informative. Excellent. Um, I know we're out of time, so I'd like to wrap and say thank you very much, Dr. Kasalik, for joining us on our show. It's been a pleasure, David. Yep. I really appreciate it. Thank you for making me feel comfortable. You bet. Uh, it's been very educational. If anybody has any questions regarding today's show or other topics they'd like to see, you can visit our website at www.wscssheboygan.com and then contact us there. Uh, again, for Quality of Life, on behalf of Dr. David Kosalik, I'm Dave Augustine. Thank you for watching.